Hello and welcome back to On the Sunny Side. On the Sunny Side is a new digital TV show on F15. And over here, we interview entrepreneurs, technologists, researchers, business leaders, people who are shaping the digital economy and using technology for good. Now today with me is an extraordinarily accomplished guest. She is a US national champion and Hall of Fame gymnast. She's a serial entrepreneur and investor, and she's the founder of the Glow Leadership Program, as well as the Enoughness Podcast, which she regularly hosts. So welcome to the show, Lisa Carmen Wen. Thank you, Sunny, I'm excited to be here. For those who tune in regularly to On the Sunny Side, they know I always start the show with something I call Sunny's Fast Five. Five questions, where I try to get to know you sort of one sentence at a time. Are you ready for that? Yes. All right, let's do it. So easy starters, uh, are you a morning or a night person? I'm a night person. Now, if you had a time machine, you could travel anywhere to any time period, where would you go? I would love to I think there's two sides. I would like to go to the past, to the time when um, women were, um, when we passed the amendment to allow women to vote in the US. And I think it would have just been such an incredible time to be there. Um, and, and I think we're still in that historical moment now where things are changing. And then I'd like to fast forward to the future when women and men are truly equal and see what that's like and you know and I hope that by the time my children or great-grandchildren are born that that is a possibility so yeah I would love to see when when women are running companies at a 50 percent level what is it that right now in this moment excites you about my life or the world pick anyone I am excited about this year and how much learning and growth there has been for everyone. I think that people come from challenging positions and they either they, ref, they either falter and stay there or they grow stronger. And so I think I'm really excited to be in the year 2020 when there's so much in just really difficult things that are happening, but I, I'm excited to see how much growth comes from it, both from a personal side as well as from a societal and cultural side. What is success to you? Success to me has changed over time. And um, what I can say is success for me is not, um, it is not a checkbox. It is not more money. It is not more titles or awards anymore. It is just, truly feeling free um, and fulfilled and um, committed to a focus and creating impact in the world. You are an extraordinary human, not only in that you have been in the, uh, and are in the Hall of Fame as a gymnast, you reach just about everything one could reach um, as an athlete in your, in your field but you're also a serial entrepreneur. What to you are some of those parallels? The two biggest traits I think are focus and perseverance. The act of being a gymnast and achieving at the highest level, uh, from the age of nine, I said I wanted to go to the Olympics, which was a 10 year goal that I set. And for the next 10 years, I worked towards a very clear focus and that was my North Star. And so no matter how difficult times got, no matter how many times I wanted to quit, I didn't and I persevered because I had, I had such a clear, and it was a very lofty goal, you know, it's, it's, and the thing is, it's not a guarantee, it's never a guarantee. And I think that that taught me that, um, you know, it's, it taught me how to stay on track and, and care for something that was bigger um, that I didn't even know why I dreamed that, but um, I stuck to that goal. And I think as an entrepreneur, that's the same thing you do. You come in with a vision for yourself and a vision for what you want to create with your path. 
and everyone will tell you you're crazy, you're stupid, you might go bankrupt in the middle of it, and somehow you have to keep focusing on it and get back up. And you know, to the point of persistence as well, as a gymnast, you fall so many times. And when you fall and you feel that physical pain and shame and embarrassment, and you still have to get back up, um, and you have to do it in front of millions of people, and you realize that you don't die from that embarrassment and that shame, um, and you keep doing it, you know? And I think as an entrepreneur, it's the same thing. The number of times that you fall flat on your face uh, in front of people, in front of press, in front of investors, and you realize, you know, the only thing I can do is just get back up. And I think that oftentimes the people who succeed are just the ones who have a big enough vision, commit to it, and continue to get back up when even when it feels like you can't. When you missed the Olympics by 0 0.25 percentage points, how did you get back up? Yeah, that was one of the toughest moments in my life. And I was 19 years old. And that moment was when everything that I dreamed of for 10 years that I believed about myself completely shattered. So it's a, a, a huge shattering of identity. And um, at that point, it was one of those moments where I said, I wanna quit. And I just said, I never wanna see this sport again. I never want to be in contact with anything. Um, but what I realized then, and I, I don't think I consciously recognized it, was that I, my identity wasn't as a gymnast, it was as a winner. And I said to myself, well, winners don't quit when they're down. And so instead of quitting, I chose to continue training for another year. And I flew to Russia to the Russian Olympic Training Center, which is the most rigorous training center in the world to become the best possible gymnast I could be and prove to myself that I could do it even without the motivation, the external motivation of going to the Olympics. And I was doing it for myself. And that year I ended up my last competition at the USA National Championships. And that's where I won every single gold medal and athlete of the year. And then I said, okay, now I'm done and I'm going to Yale. And so I, I think I had to prove to myself that that wasn't it for me. Like I wasn't going to let the, the failure to get to the Olympics define my entire 10 year career. And I was going to choose the ending of that chapter of my life. That is just remarkable. And I mean, absolutely uh, incredible also to then be in the, to be also recognized for that as a, as a hall of fame gymnast today. Now, that was the beginning, in a way, of the next chapter of your life. You went to Yale, graduated, and eventually you went from Wall Street to entrepreneurship and uh, built a company, sold it. How did that journey happen to a place where you ended up selling your company? Yeah, well, I studied literature in college and I ended up working at a hedge fund in New York. Um, I would say that one of the things that I'm very in touch with is my intuition. And over the years, I've really started to listen to that feeling, um, which so often we trump with logic and we say logic is more important than how you feel. And I don't think that's true anymore. Um, but when I was in corporate, I felt just unhappy and fulfilled and like my, that creative side of me that could make so much more impact, it wasn't being fulfilled. And I had no other reason than that to leave because I was, it was a good salary. It was a good repu reputable firm. It was, uh, as my boss said, a golden opportunity and how could I ever let it go when so many other people wanted to be in my position. And I just did. Um, and I, the only thing I can say is I just, I didn't, I was at that point in my life, even though it was really early, I was only 23, four, I think. Um, and I just said, I'm not happy. 
and that's the only reason I can I can give right now. Um, and I have no idea what I'm going to do next. And so when I did take the leap, the thing that I found uh, that I thought could fulfill that was entrepreneurship, um, which would give me that creative freedom. And it certainly did, but it didn't come without its struggles. So I don't want to ever glamorize being an entrepreneur. Um, but the, the thing about being an entrepreneur is that you get to solve, you get to choose the problem you want to solve. And for me, being on Wall Street, you know, being, I started my first company, it was a food tech company and raising money in Silicon Valley and just realizing the first time as a young woman, a young minority woman in tech, that it was really hard being a woman and especially raising capital. And this is all prior to Me Too, prior to all the initiatives specifically helping getting more female founders funded and um, there were no real communities to to connect with other female entrepreneurs who were actively raising capital and coming up against the same challenges and so that was where the idea of she works was born um, and she works was the the goal was closing the funding gap by collaborating and not competing and so we organized events we had community we brought in investors we helped women get funded um, we ended up probably funneling around $30 million in funding for female entrepreneurs with our community um, and doing over 300 events, um, specifically helping women get their pitch decks, their ideas, their, um, their funding ready. So that was, that was a really, really rewarding, difficult experience. Um, and it was, you know, we, we, we helped over 20,000 female entrepreneurs from around the world. And we ended up selling that to Republic and Republic is an incredible company. They are the leading equity crowdfunding platform. So equity crowdfunding means that anyone can invest in a startup, $10, $20. It's like Kickstarter, except you actually get equity instead of just prizes. So um, women tend to outperform men about 30% on average on crowdfunding sites because even if you don't come from a community where you have a lot of rich friends or family um, and you're starting out you know women and minorities tend to not be in the boys club right off the bat and so you can leverage the power of your community to help fund your business and so I was really happy when that happened because we found a, a parent for the baby um, that I had helped grow and we had the same values and long-term vision for how we wanted to change the landscape for uh, women founders. Do you think it has truly changed in these past few years or is it still as difficult as it was for you uh, back then in Silicon Valley to raise funding as a, as a female founder? 2% of funding goes to female founders, less than 5% of investors are women. Um, I'm sure that's moved a few percentage points, but we're still very, very far away from true equality. So I think it's important for people to remember that just because there's media attention around it, it doesn't excuse just, um, you know, sitting back and allowing things to continue as they were. So um, I think that there's, I think it's incredible that people are paying attention, both men and women. Um, but I think that there's, there's kind of deeper, now it's about the unconscious biases, right? And the unconscious ways that we continue to, to navigate the world that need to be rooted out. With the Global Leadership Program, uh, you very much also focus on providing leadership skills in a digital world and beyond uh, to women what is your current venture about? Yeah, well, one of the things that I learned in working with thousands of women through SheWorks and helping them with their uh, fundraise is that at the end of the day, you can teach someone as many tactics as you want, but if she doesn't feel like she is good enough, if she doesn't feel truly confident in her ability to raise and run a company, she never closes the deal. And that goes for anything that you do. She doesn't close the deal, the funding, the negotiation. Um, and so for me, it always goes back to funding or you know, pay inequality is a symptom of a greater underlying problem. 
And that underlying problem for a lot of women goes back to confidence, right? True confidence in your voice, in what you deserve, in the amount of space you take up. And guilt like, is a big thing. We feel guilty about so many things. Um, guilty for being too loud, for being not loud enough, for speaking a certain way, for asking for too much. And this guilt prevents us from being powerful leaders. And I think that leadership is, uh, you know, there's masculine and feminine qualities of leadership that, and everyone, men and women have masculine and feminine qualities. And so the the thing is, how do you embrace your unique feminine leadership style as a woman while still being respected in a highly masculine business world? And that's what the GLOW Leadership Program is focused on. It's the root of the problem, which is, it's not about teaching women, you know, how to run Facebook ads or like, you know, tactical things, which is a lot of you know, email marketing, whatever you have. It's about those core skills of how do you truly believe in yourself and how do you speak in a way that you feel confident and the other side also reads your body language, hears your voice and command how, how you command attention and respect in a room that is primarily men. How do you believe in yourself? You know, it's all of those things. And you know, we used to call those soft skills, but I call them real skills. When is it enough? And what does that mean to you, that question? Yeah, it's funny. At the end of every enoughness podcast episode, I ask people how they define enoughness and um, when is it ever enough? That's the whole purpose of the podcast is striving to answer that question. And it's funny because there were uh, there were a few months where I stopped recording and um, I stopped recording because I felt like I had reached a place of feeling like I was enough, like the enoughness, like I felt it because I, I was truly, I felt content and confident in myself. I wasn't doubting myself anymore. And, and the funny thing was, the moment I reached enoughness, then I thought, well, let me use this momentum and do more, you know, double down and work harder. Now write my book and do all these things. And then recently I actually released another episode called Confessions of an Overachiever. I've been a total hypocrite because I realized that again, I fell into the same cycle of feeling like I wasn't doing enough or it wasn't enough. And so um, the answer to that is, I don't know. And I think that's what makes it such a powerful concept is that um, our society is fundamentally driven by success and wanting more. That's just what a consumer capitalist society drives us to do. Um, as there are more people on this earth, it seems like you have to compete for resources because our resources are getting more scarce. And so, um, I think it's about fulfillment and contentment with yourself feeling. I thought of it as a feeling. It's like feeling enough while still being able to strive for big goals. What is so your number one piece of leadership advice? My number one piece of leadership advice is that to always remember that you're in control of your own reality. And it's very easy, especially this year in 2020 to feel like you're, external world and everything that's happening outside and allow that to dictate how you feel inside. Um, and I know that a lot of people have been feeling anywhere in the spectrum from depressed to lacking hope to frustrated and angry. And um, I always step back and remember that I control how I feel. And you can, it's a conscious decision to to notice how you're how you're doing, um, and it it doesn't mean to suppress your emotions. It means to really allow them, like allow yourself to feel it, but realize that things are always changing. And you know, especially as a leader, it's those that sort of self awareness is really really important because the moment you're a leader, you're not just in charge of 
your own feelings, you now have to manage, you know, everyone else who's around you and, and know that they also have their feelings and their baggage and their experiences. Um, and at the end of the day, being a leader is it's a, it's managing people and expectations. And so the first person you need to manage is yourself. Lisa, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I'm just uh, in awe at everything that we could unravel in these few minutes we had together. I um, wish you all the very best and just thank you so much. Thank you, Sunny.